Well, y'all know what time it is when you hear the music there. I'm Kenyatta Cavill, Dr. Cavill, inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Watson, Charles Bishop. Uh, we are here in Atlanta. We are actually in the new state of art Mercedes Benz Stadium here in Atlanta, Georgia. It's cold in Atlanta. Right? <laughs> I don't know how they said it's hot in Atlanta. Uh, not today. I don't know about today. <laughs> last couple of days. We got a little warm one in there, and boy, did it. Time out. You got some names on there. Let's give a shout out. Anybody jump on uh, their mic in regards to some of the names? Oh, yeah. You got Mr. Chad Jones already chiming in here. Mr. Howard Barty Jr. Chad well, was in there early. He saw us setting up. I see you, Chad. You ready for the big game today? Uh, yeah, I know Chad. Uh, beer ready. <laughs> you Who else you got up there? Ah, we got my sister, Sonia Washington. She said, hey, y'all. All right. Hey, it's time to go. Uh -huh. Uh, we also have uh, some people chiming over here. I got us a look. We got a couple of uh, FaceTime lives coming in. As you right. see, some of the practice of the uh, Star Spangled Banner behind us. Curtis Norman Simon is watching Big Curtis. Is, uh, he's ex experiential, uh, big time leader. Uh, used to be uh, with uh, BET when they did the HBCU football games. He has HBCU X uh, network where he's working with HBCUs to understand how to get more of the FaceTime in regards to yeah. broadcasting HBCU games here. Wendell Davis has joined us. Howard Barty is up. I see you, Howard. Dr. Barty. Dr. Barty. Getting up there. He came Doc. to the HBCU ARC conference a couple of weeks ago and uh, got to partake in the SWAT championship game, which led to Gremlin defeating uh, Alcorn State Braves in that matchup. Mm -hmm. But uh, obviously, this show is going to be full of stats, data, behind the scene information that you can get in regards to what to expect from this uh, celebration bowl that will be kicking off in less than two hours mm -hmm. as we get ready. Uh, noon here, but we're ready to go. Again, I'm joined with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Yeah. Tell everybody how, what are some of the News and dates, obviously, we're focusing on just the celebration boat. So anything news, hot, or uh, things that you experienced this week in regards to the celebration boat that uh, you can give? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, uh, 
a lot of uh, events going into the Celebration Bowl uh, were really fun. I had an opportunity to participate in the NFL uh, forum uh, uh, yesterday uh, that was put on a tremendous experience getting them to meet a lot of uh, NFL uh, personnel and executives, a lot of uh, college students and whatnot who came uh, for the NFL forum from uh, quite a few HBCUs. Uh, tremendous, tremendous setup. Uh, you got a a very good uh, understanding of all the jobs that are within the NFL. Celebration Bowl did a tremendous job in, in bringing down these people and uh, letting us uh, experience it. We also had the uh, uh, the Hall of Fame celebration ceremonies where uh, you had gentlemen. That was on, uh, that was on uh, Thursday, Thursday night. night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so got a chance to meet uh, HBCU legends, Coach Bill Hayes, uh, Harold Carmichael from Southern. He's Bill Hayes still talking to me. Bill Hayes still talking to me. He challenged. He said, he challenged. Hey, he said, I need y'all to go and kick some butt out there. So y'all can become all famous. And exactly. All these black people in the Hall of Fame, we need some me at representation. He said, he was doing it. He was doing it. He said, he proudly will tell you he is 3 0 versus Eddie Robinson. He said, he did. Wow. Exactly. He just put it on the table like that. Very much so. That so, was a tremendous experience. Let me formally go back and welcome everybody. You kind of said hello and did a shout out. Mark Overton has joined us. Uh, Howard Barty said, what's going on, guys? Hold mm -hmm. up the light. And looking forward to coverage from the Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Certainly, we're going to bring you that breaking news and coverage of any of that that comes up. So welcome and thanks for joining us for the only weekly sports talk radio show that is dedicated mm -hmm. to exploring the sporting HBCU dash with this unique HBCU culture identity, including the teams, the bands, coaches, athletic directors, and classic and homecoming events as well as uh, presidents, commissioners, uh, executive directors we've had on here in terms uh, including uh, looking at this as well as the sport management business practices and competitive sports industry. Uh, the show seeks to provide innovative, progressive, and informative and dialogue about the week's HBCU sporting events issues and ideas from a fan's perspective. And we have the Southwestern Athletic Conference, better known as the SWAC, the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference, better known as the MEAC of the NCAA Division I, we also cover the Southern Intercollegiate Athletic Conference, SIAC, Central Intercollegiate Athletic Association, CIAA of the NCAA Division II, Gold Coast Athletic Conference, GCAC of the NAIA, and independent program such as Hampton of the Big South. The Big yeah. South. The new, big, uh, new part of, of the Big South. That's yeah, crazy. <laughs> the new, new part of the Big South. Yeah, Tennessee State of the yeah. OBC. Yeah. Obviously, uh, Langston used to be of the Central State Football League. They're now moving in the Sooner Athletic Conference, along with Texas College as a football only member over there. Uh, but we also cover uh, the Red River Athletic Conference in terms of the HBCU programs for basketball. But we're going to concentrate on football. Kevin Allen has joined us as a jumping in in there, yeah. uh, talking about that. So just wanted to get into perspective. You talked about Thursday and Friday, mm -hmm. uh, events that you participated in, and then we kicked off Wednesday. To kick, they kick everything off and they go down to the aquarium. Yes, yes. It is a delight when you come in there and you go to the aquarium. And anybody who's been to any of these aquariums around, obviously Atlanta's Georgia Aquarium, as they call it, is one of the best in the world. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the belly of the aquarium, as you go in there, you have this big tank in the back. Yes. Yes. And it, there's this gigantic whale and all these other fish that come whale through there. Sharks. The whale sharks. Uh -huh. And you can just see these college athletes, these young men, and you can see the childlike experience oh, wow. on their face. And they can't wait to get to this window. I don't care what everything else is going on. There's great food, uh, uh -huh. great comedic affair going on there, great experiences. Welcome from everybody. But they all seem to gravitate to this window. Uh -huh. And I must admit, I found a way over there, too, and took a couple of pictures. But they had, I sent some uh, pictures out on uh, Instagram where you see one of the triad parts of the picture I have where you have the diver in there. Mm -hmm. And he actually has this aquarium, and he says, celebrate, <laughs> welcome, welcome celebration of this uh, mm -hmm. with the uh, um, Georgia Aquarium, so it is fascinating, and then they get to go after they eat the dinner. They get to go around in there, and part of it they added this year was the family feud. Oh, so they got a couple of players, about four or five from each team, mm. and they literally did battles of the family feud, and it was hilarious. Very much. So. It was hilarious. Yeah. So um, you really the celebration bowl under the leadership of John Grant, the executive director here, does a wonderful job, in my opinion, in regards to 
There's yeah. no question that this is a legit, bold feeling to this. Mm -hmm. They spare no expenses to make sure the students are feel, feel good. You actually have uh, ESPN VPs come down, mm -hmm. uh, participate in this all week. So this right. is not something they just putting out or let is John Grant. They are actually here mm -hmm. shaking hands with people, thanking people for coming and wanting to be a part of this. Mike, you were able to get in here Friday, uh, see some some couple of things. What was your experience? Uh, from getting around with some of the other events that you were able to attend that are subsidiaries of what's going on yeah. Celebration Bowl. Yeah, and unfortunately I got in a little bit <clears throat> late uh, due to other circumstances, but the feeling just getting on the plane, <laughs> I think I shared with you, is that I met a lot of North Carolina A&T alumni on the plane. Yeah. And they were braggadocious, had a chip on their shoulder, yeah. literally, We've from the moment they week. boarded the plane. You better believe it. And they, this was North Carolina A&T, not only in the Texas area, but coming from Arizona. They have a chip on their shoulder. It's clear throughout the fan base. So that struck me first. The second is the vibe in the city. Mm. When you step to the airport, you saw signs of the Celebration Bowl. So it's, it's really... It's signs that this event is growing, that the city has really embraced it. So that's kind of what I experienced, kind of coming in a little bit on the mid side and on the downside yeah. after all the pregame pre game activities. So I think you great points you make there. So, uh, got to go to the media press conference yesterday yeah. while uh, Charles was taking an event with the NFL and, and showing off and getting to shake hands with yeah. the NFL. Yeah, <laughs> hobnobbing with the you know, yeah. Obviously. <laughs> Uh, we're just, and we're myself just, are not on the same page right now. We're just blessed to be in this presence. <laughs> yeah, we just want to let you do all that. But you're right. One of the things that I asked the question mm -hmm. was is I saw this this need for respect. Mm -hmm. And boy, when I asked that question, it lit yeah. a fire. Everybody in there, it's like, dog, come here, look what you started. I, I felt it. I thought somebody needed to ask the question. Uh, let me give a shout out to uh, uh, Tina. She jumps in here and says, was there a tiger shark? It was probably looking for Bishop. <laughs> <laughs> Raymond Holly has jumped in. Yeah. And Raymond Holly is right here in Atlanta. Uh, he'll be taking great pictures uh, throughout the game as he was in the media mix yesterday and probably has been pa passing some out as he does uh, pictures for several of the HBC sports, most regionally, uh, Prairie View A&M University, Texas Southern University, as well as HBCUsports.com. HBCU Game Day, they've been in the mix. Uh, we've seen the type of news they've broken all week. Oh, yeah, so absolutely. Don't be surprised if they try to yeah. find some stuff out here. But the big talk around here still was a dual sharp in some way. Um, particular emergency came up, as Executive John Grant said, mm -hmm. uh, Wednesday and Thursday, but he was here nonetheless for all those folks that are reading it. He was here yesterday, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so he's in the mix. Nothing to be worried about there. Uh, Levada, uh, James is uh, on as well. Uh, give us some updates. In, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Rodney there. Clark said, what's up, Yada? Rodney Clark grew up, me, grew up with me in Waco back there. He was actually schoolyard partners, if you would. High school classmates with my brother Cheo, um, so they're good friends. But yeah, he's he's uh, coming along. Hey with Rodney, you know him when he had the dreads, right? Okay. <laughs> Man, some wrong with y'all, some wrong with y'all. Uh, um, Craig Shelton is on the line. Thank you for jumping in, Craig. Is doing some great work uh, back in the Houston area, particularly at the professional level. He gets in there and stirs it up and makes sure people. Uh, traditional media, if you want to call it that, make sure they stay straight. Uh, Watchdog Media, where he really gets in the folks and doesn't let them get away with just being uh, traditional mm -hmm. media folks. Make sure that the facts are right. right. They're covering all the information. Mm -hmm. So, Craig, keep up the great work that you're doing out yeah. there. He does some radio as well, uh, so you can listen to him, particularly if you want to go inside the professional level of the NFL um, and NBA there in Houston. You can go to his internet page and get all his uh, information there too. Yeah. So, Todd uh, Jackson. Craig continue Todd. to get that stuff. Todd, Todd Jackson. Todd Jackson. He's a, a president, a former president of the TSU uh, Alumni Association, the athletic department. He goes in there and asks a lot of tough questions, make sure that they're raising funds for athletics. As Texas Southern, as some people would say, trying to get back in the football bid. Nah. I'm nah. A bit. I'm nah. Go That's a little discussion for everybody. <laughs> I tell you, one of the things that jumps out with you, though, Dr. Kavil, and we'll go back to the family feud, is 
I know we're going to get a great game today. Oh yeah. The teams are already competitive. Yeah. <laughs> you go back to that. Oh, yeah, you go yeah, back yeah. to the little family. Oh, said, they did not they really got into it, they got but they didn't want to lose. And oh. when they had an answer come up on that little thing, they said, "Ding!" <laughs> right. Oh, they got it. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I don't yeah, think it's this good on television. Yeah, I was about to say, like, man, this is taking on a different vibe. <laughs> well, we promised the people that we would get into the numbers. You know, yeah. a lot of people here are people talking about uh, uh, this game. Obviously, it doesn't take much to sell this game when you have 11 and 0 undefeated North Carolina A&T, mm-hmm. 8 and 0 in the MEAC conference, coming in against Grambling, 11 and 1, 8 and 0 in the SWAC. Uh, neither team has lost to the FCS opponent. North Carolina A&T team has defeated. The FBS team in Charlotte. Uh, they're ranked seventh in both the national uh, FCS polls. Graham is ranked 12th and 13th nationally in the polls. Mm-hmm. Yep. Respectively, one and two in most HBCU uh, sports polls with AT number one, Grambling number two. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've had them ranked number one in my uh, Dr. Ville's inside, I mean, Dr. Ville's major division mm-hmm. poll rankings. Uh, and the only week that it didn't go that way is when I started out with Grambling number one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And after that first loss, they dipped, and A&T has held the courts ever since. Mm-hmm. But we get a chance here not to only hold up a Celebration Bowl trophy, but it's obvious whoever wins this game will become uh, the black national champion, Absolutely. as we call but, it. Without uh, question. Mystical in terms of that. Even with such institutions, I don't want to leave Matt Langston going regular season undefeated and Virginia State going undefeated. And that's why I created the mid-major division as they shared the mid-major HBCU National Champion Initiative. So a lot going on there. Uh, but what are some numbers that have st- stuck out to you, Charles, when we get into sure. some of the numbers that people want to look at as they start to break down this game? Well, of course, uh, we take a look at both teams. Uh, uh, one coming in undefeated, 11-0. Uh, Gramlin comes in with only one loss to, the FBS, to an FBS opponent, Tulane. But uh, some numbers that jumped out uh, at me with North Carolina A&T, uh, they haven't lost a game, obviously, with their quarterback, Lamar Rainer. Uh, he is uh, 25 career stars. He hadn't lost a game. Yes. But the thing that really jumps out at you with North Carolina A&T, defense, defense, defense. Uh, you take a look uh, in the past – uh, seven seasons, 17 times they've shut out an opponent. Absolutely. 17 times they shut out. Shut them out. Shut out an opponent. Uh, a number that should really kind of jump out at you. Um, North Carolina NT, when they are going into the fourth quarter, 51 and 2. That, that's that's <laughs> mind boggling. Uh, so you don't, take, so you don't want to be behind. You don't, you don't want to be behind. behind. You don't want to yeah, be absolutely. behind this team. I mean, uh, and we talk about it all the time in terms of uh, the, the, the personality of the conference uh, playing that, that bully ball. And we're really running the football, being physical, being smash mouth, really grinding you to, to, um, the, to a pulp by the fourth quarter. And that statistic is just one of those things that really just jumped out at me. Absolutely. Mike, what are some things that you say the uh, listeners – and viewers should take out of this matchup. Yeah, just getting and, started. Here. And, and just just to piggyback on what Charles was saying, it's that both teams are well balanced. Mm. Both teams have powerful, all, but there's going to be something we'll get about a chance the big to go defense. into some players yeah. and people to look at, yeah. right? Uh, in terms of the offensive defense, but as you're saying, yeah. you're talking about overall, and you're right, yeah. very balanced team. Yes. Mm-hmm. So defensive, if you. Put those two in, par- in parallel throughout the whole 2017 season. Both teams, number one, rushing defense. Hmm. In their respective leagues, they're number one and two, that's Grambling and uh, A&T, and pass defense. Here's the thing, turnover margin. Hmm. Plus 21 for Grambling, mm-hmm. plus 16 for A&T. They turn you over. They turn you over. Yeah. Uh, t- uh, the other one was red zone offense or red zone defense. Red zone defense, both teams are 70%. So that means you can get in the red zone, but unlike other teams, which are 80 and 90%, only 70% t- of the time are teams allowed to score, and if they're allowed to score 50% of that time, they're reducing it to a field goal. Wow. Grambling has seven turnovers in the red zone this year. Mm. That's tops among both leagues. That's so, the, so yeah. to your point, mm-hmm. defense. There's going to be a defensive play that stands out today. Mm-hmm. Very much so. Certainly, as you said, I had a football in hand. It's all football <laughs> business today. As we give some people see what they want to do. Craig's daily affirmation just mm-hmm. to let you know his thoughts, and I think it ties in what you're talking about for both these teams eventually. 
a cunt is always captured, caged, and returned to his natural habitat in the boom. <laughs> <laughs> that's what Craig Shelton preaches. That's, that's, that's some 25th, 21st century poetry. <laughs> Instead of Confucius, Craig Shelton says. Craig Shelton. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. I like that. So oh, that's what he, he brings to, to the table here. Ernie Smithers, line brother. How you doing, Ernie? 06? <laughs> there you go. Langston English, uh, uh, Aggie out there, he's in town. Hadn't been able to catch up with him, uh, but I'm sure he's proud of his Aggies. Mm -hmm. He just, he's a nervous person, so he, he's going to watch with one eye open. Uh, he just wants to have him win. Wendell Davis, great job, guys. Keep up the good work. Mm -hmm. Long live Ada Gamma. PB Proud, Big oh. Sexy, RTR. Big Sexy. <laughs> oh, man, there's just some, something about having a name like Big yeah, sexy. sexy. You just throw your birth certificate yeah, in my house. Yeah, don't worry about <laughs> just call me Big Sexy. Yeah, everybody loves Big Sexy. <laughs> I just wow. wish I had that type of dilemma. <laughs> KC Price is up here watching. Appreciate mm. you. Yes, much love when the Davis says you get it done. Mm. Uh, PB Proud, appreciate you out there as we shout it out. Um, obviously, talk about Chad Gramlin. He's put out some numbers. Uh, he didn't. Is he predicting any scores? Uh, he's kind of back there. He's gonna watch on the no, score. No, he's a little quiet. He's kind of back back. He's been so. predicting all yeah, the chairs. Exactly. The so the now he's down. all of a sudden he's quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and you got KC Price. He got to throw his stuff in there. Yo, yo, yo. You know what he talking about? Yes, yeah, so oh, uh, yeah. And the boys are red and white. They find a way to get in. <laughs> so. Let's go a little bit in, in some things I want you to talk about and think about this here. Um, as we talked about, the seven ranked Aggies are coming in 24 and 10 uh, with a win over Arch Rival, North Carolina Central, on number 18. I thought it was interesting that both teams had to travel through their rivals to get here. Mm -hmm. And uh, fascinating. And for grounding, there's multiple rivals. We'll get a little more into that. The win for the Aggies uh, ha have 10 seniors. Who have been playing for four years and approved to 39 and 18. Yep. Uh, that historically is the best class uh, that's come through the Aggies. Wow. Uh, 40th victory mm -hmm. to date mm -hmm. yeah. in regards to how many W's they put on the board. And then you talk about such luminary coaches as A&T Coach Broadway is finding a way to continue to climb that ladder. He's trying to see if he can get on that Final Four monument. Hey. Now, with HBCU coaches, yeah. it's hard yeah. enough just to get the Final Four, but the fact that he's trying that you're to get yeah. yeah. up right. yes, to me, says something. Exactly. And the fact that he's done it at three schools and he can find a way to get multiple bid at one school, I think really says a lot mm -hmm. in terms of what's going on uh, there in, in the mix, uh, in, in terms of what's going on there. We got a little Deucey chiming in uh, as we doing the show. What's going on, Deucey? That's my son there. He yeah. always trying to find a way to be in the Deuce! Deuce! And so, as we get it done, you also look at Broadway, uh, North Carolina, graduate of 77. So he's had a lot of experience at the FBS level. But a and he holds a 58 and 22. He is uh, 72, 73%. 72.5, point 0.725 is say winning yeah. record to be exact. Mm -hmm. Wow. He spent four years, seasons apiece at North Carolina Central and Gramlin, and has an overall record of 100, 126 and 45. Point seven three four in terms of the mix Mixer. there, in terms of what he's ever able to do. Yeah. Um, which is interesting to me in terms of that. Uh, he's won a black national championship of each of his coaching spots is where we talk about mm -hmm. his legendary status. So let's take a break there and just yeah. go in to Rob Broadway. Uh, we've had a chance to talk to him a couple of times and get his no-nonsense, this one type <laughs> approach. Mm -hmm. But give me a little thoughts on Rod Broadway. Well, obviously, like you said, anytime you're, you know, in, in the mix in, in terms of, uh, talking about being on a Mount Rushmore of HBCU coaches, uh, Coach Broadway is definitely, you know, within striking distance, if not already there. And the, the thing that just strikes me all the time about Coach Broadway is he's very down to earth, very simple about oh, yeah. going out and winning. And, you know, uh, I believe it was a couple years ago, he said, all we do is make chicken. You know, we might <laughs> season a little different. Man, he came up with a kid. <laughs> <laughs> we could make chicken. We could yeah. make chicken. Yeah. 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 He ain't doing a little bit. We might yeah. have a little barbecue yeah. on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But we make chicken. You know, we make chicken. We might fry it. Exactly. We might bake it. But right. at the end of the day, it's, it's still chicken. chicken. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and you just you laugh at the simplicity of it. But, you know, 
All he does is just win. And, you know, it's just, it's the way he goes about doing. You know, yeah. hard running game, defense, 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 defense is going to be a hallmark. Yeah, for hallmark he definitely. Clubs, if there's any copyright here, I, I totally agree, Charles. If there's mm-hmm. any copyright, defense. Yes, indeed. Uh, is 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 the hallmark. I think when I think of him, I think of, I think of uh, pedigree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's he. Broadway teams have played in what what three NCAA postseason tournaments. Mm-hmm. He's taken three teams to the championship. Yeah. I mean, if you look at it, I mean, pedigree. He took over a team that was mirrored in NCAA sanctions and had to basically rebuild it from the top. Wow. From the bottom up. So that to me tells me about his no nonsense approach, his ability to build a team, and it also tells me about his ability to recruit. Yes. That's the part, you know, yeah. we talk about recruiting all the time, and he just brings in guys that just get it done consistently. Yeah. You, well, you, and I'm sorry, you met him, you've spent a little bit more time. What did, I mean, for a no nonsense guy to be able to recruit, what did, what did his, what gleamed out about his personality that uh, maybe led to his success? To yeah, you know, I was sitting there thinking about that the other day, and if, and I was, if I was, you know, a parent who had a child, you know, there's, um, a child of age to play football, there's no doubt, you know, Coach Broadway sits in your living room and just kind of gives you, you know, uh, just a down earth, down to earth, down home feeling in terms of, you know, your child's going to be, you know, in, in, in a family, he's going to be looked out for, things of that nature, but, you know, he's going to learn the proper way to play this game of football, and that has to give you a, a common feeling as a parent and whatnot to, to send your child to somebody to play for a Coach Absolutely. Broadway like that. You know, in a lot of ways, similarities, I think, to the great Eddie Robinson. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and which he has given a lot of great uh, praise to. Mm-hmm. He said it again yesterday. He brought up the chicken comment during the press conference yesterday. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no matter what bring up. So my question back to him after I got the students brought up, I asked him, I said, well, I want to talk about going into this kitchen a little bit and, and kicking up this great soul food, this mm-hmm. great chicken that you do. Mm-hmm. And so I, I asked him about, you know, what is his secret over the places they've gone. He went to a couple couple of different items that he blogged with, but basically he said it's about getting great players. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I thought that was an excellent point, how he makes the shine go back to his players mm-hmm. in many different ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jimmy Wilson has jumped on. He said, Bishop Mike, what's up? Sonny Watson is over here too. Say, Tina said, don't get it twisted. What do you say, Jimmy? Southern is Grammar's rival, not all corn. We have played them because they are the strength of the East. I agree with that. Actually, I was saying that uh, to get here that uh, Gramlin had to go to basically two of their rivals, first Southern in the Bayou Classic, and then obviously Graham, uh, all corn State in the SWAC Championship game. Yep. And so certainly understand that Gr- Southern is uh, the rival there, no question about it. Uh, Jimmy chimes in and said, Broadway is an old coach, fundamental coach, run the ball and plays defense. That's it. Yep. Which is true, but yep. we're going to surprise you a bit when we get into the quarterback. Yep. And, and in fact, I think it's a great time to get into uh, the accolade of uh, Lamar. Rainer. Yeah. Rainer mm-hmm. in terms of his uh, stellar play. Yeah. They are passing the ball a lot more, which surprised a lot of people out there that follow Broadway. As Jimmy alluded to, most of the time we're used to him talking about running the ball, and he's still playing great defense. Don't get that twisted. In right. fact, that's what the bread and butter on, no matter what they do on the offensive side. But uh, as we alluded to a little earlier, Lamar, uh, one of the big stats out there that a lot of people like to bring up is the fact that any every time that he's got behind the center and played the game for mm-hmm. A&T, they have not lost. They have not yes. lost. And, and, and – you know, we talk, we've talked about Devontae Kincaid, obviously, tremendous ball player. But he, here's something that a lot of people don't know. Lamar Rainer has thrown for more yards than Devontae Kincaid this past season. Absolutely. Uh, Lamar Rainer, he's tossed uh, for 2,700 yards. Devontae Kincaid, 2,400 yards. But, you know, of course, we know a t They can run the football, dominant uh, offensive line. But they've opened it up a little bit more this year. And, you know that that is uh, it's a study in contrast, but it's a study in the same sort of of, of teams in terms of A&T and Gremlin. That's why I know we're going to get a phenomenal game. Certainly, when you're talking about to get it done, let me go inside some of the numbers, Lamar, and get your thoughts a little more on this, Mike, and then we'll come back to you, Charles. Okay. 186 for 285, 26 touchdowns, yep. so just five interceptions, 51 attempts, 168 rushing yards, three touchdowns. Uh, in terms of big games, 19 for 22, 321. Uh, yards, three touchdowns versus uh, George. Um, uh, in, in terms of uh, those big games he played in, just to give you one, 
to give you some other, uh, other components of Lamar, uh, he just finds a way to get it done. You talked about over 2,000 plus yards passing. Mm -hmm. uh, tremendous, tremendous, tremendous. 2,707 to be exact uh, in terms of some of those things. As I said, uh, 29 uh, touchdowns there. What are your thoughts on Lamar? Uh, if, I, if you look into the statistics and you look at receptions, he does a great job of spreading the ball around. Mm. You have one receiver, uh, Elijah Bell, that's basically in the top five, yet they're number one in passing offense. So mm -hmm. he's spreading the ball around to a lot of different receivers. He also has a very good relationship with uh, Markel Card. Uh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Markel Cartwright. They played together for nine years. Isn't that so? <laughs> ten, nine, ten years. Going back to when they were like little peewees. Mm -hmm. So there's a comfort with the coach. There's a comfort with the running back. And there seems to be a comfort uh, with, with the receiving core. So that allows him not only to understand the scheme of the offense, but how to distribute the ball. And that's something we don't see and talk a lot about with our quarterbacks, that ability to spread the ball across uh, different wide receivers, which is something we did not expect, as you alluded to, of a and coming into this 2017 season. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Charles, well, I a think, little bit of your thoughts on Lamar. Yeah, I think the thing that jumps out uh, with Lamar, um, accuracy. I mean, mm -hmm. he's, he's around 65%. Hits around 65% of his passes. Yep. And, you know, he has a big play threat. And uh, Elijah Bell, a guy who's caught 11 touchdowns this past season. But to your point, Mike, he spreads it around, spreads the love yeah. around. So uh, he's a tough guy to defense. And then not just that, but uh, he's athletic enough to hurt you in right. terms of uh, getting out of the pocket too. So. Yeah, I agree with your great points there. Yeah. We see Ramlin starting to get – their little walkthrough out there. Yeah. 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 With, with the khakis and the black, black jacket. Man. I like that with the G. G man out it? here uh, getting a little walk in. Getting a little yeah, Checking out the stadium there. there. And, and is that is that, a, is that a and that sleep out the eyes. That's, is that A&T also? Yeah, we got A&T on. With, yeah. They kind of sizing each other up in the khakis. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's more of the A&T officials out there. I don't think uh, uh, their players have quite made it out here. But, oh, okay. uh, a little interesting there. Casey Price makes a great point. We want to shout out to David Thompson as he uh, jumps on here and checks out what we're doing here. Casey Price says Eddie Robinson, Jake Gaither, who are uh, the other two on the Mount Rushmore of you, HBC football. So I totally agree with those two. Uh, I'm going to chime in and put Billy Nix as a third one yes, that has to be absolutely. on there. Uh, yeah. I think without a question. And then it, it gets tough. Big John Merritt. John Merritt. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Certainly. I, I don't want us to get too loose with this Mount Rushmore. We want to give it credit. <laughs> if we start putting names on there. Yes, Eddie Robinson, Billy Nix, John Merritt. Right now, yeah, who who else do you – who what name do you pull off? That's what – I think it's good. Uh, you're going to get the Southern people come in here, and, and so they're going to want to put their long-term mm -hmm. coach on there yeah. to get him some love. Stay yes. named after yeah. uh, Southern coach Mumford. Yeah, Mumford. Yeah, Mumford. yeah, coach Mumford. Mumford. Who's, coach who's Mumford. legendary in his own way. So yeah. it's going to start to skew uh, on that third, fourth yeah. individual, as you said, uh, uh, in terms of maybe particular people in certain states, regional uh, areas. Yeah, because I'm going to hold up for W.C. Gordon. So I <laughs> <laughs> just want to say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tremaine Jackson is watching and April Sampleton, Sampleton from Houston, Texas. Say that. Good morning, guys. Good morning. So good thanks, morning. Uh, thank you, time. Tremaine. Thank you, April, for uh, joining, and joining so, us. But I, I think it gets good there. I think Eddie's without a question and then uh, Coach you, Gaither, yeah, definitely. It's, it's certainly very strong up yeah. there. Uh, Mumford, uh, uh, as I said. But I think you can put Eddie up there without question, and then you're going to get some regional. Yeah, yeah. 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 Regional. Regional. regional uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I think KC Price starts it off well when you start it off with Eddie Robinson, Jake Gaither. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Demo Williams has jumped in here. Demo. Uh, Jimmy says his coordinators do a great job of recruiting. No question. He yeah. also alluded to this during the press conference, is that not only do they do a great job of recruiting, I thank you for bringing that up, Jimmy, mm -hmm. uh, as he chimes in and he obviously states his place for Billy Nix being on that Mount Rushmore, mm -hmm. uh, is the fact that they have not only done well, but they've actually got better. Yes. yes. In yes. terms of understanding totally. what type of kid will be successful in their system. 
So they recruit towards a system and they recruit towards players that are good for the program. Mm -hmm. And they are not adapt to not changing the system as we've seen going with Lamar, who now can pass. Mm -hmm. And he said, oddly enough, people don't really re probably forgot this if you go back and check it out. As he coached under Steve Spurrier, he mm -hmm. said when he first got to North Carolina Central, he made a mistake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He wanted to throw the ball all over the lot. Mm -hmm. He didn't have players that were capable of doing that. That's he right. enforced the scheme on them. They didn't do well. And he said he cost himself and his team a couple of years to get where he thought they could get. And that's because he didn't recognize the need to uh, play a system around the talent he had. Right. And I think it's important because you'll have a lot of people as they name these new coaches uh, coming to these programs, they'll Great ask point. the coach what yeah. kind of offense you're going to run and things. And uh, I would suggest if you have a solid coach – one of the things he's probably going to say is, well, let me get in here and really evaluate my talent. Right. Yes. Uh, the offense I would like to run or we plan to run eventually is this. Right. But it doesn't mean we're naturally going to run it this year or we might tailor it if we run it in a way that best fits what the um, athletes I have to do. And so I think that's an important component that some of our fans need to consider uh, when talking about offensive, and defensive and schemes. Yeah, that, right. and that's a fine line, I think, for coaches because I think when you talk to them, and without a doubt, to me, <laughs> so many coaches, uh, they're stubborn. They, they want to run the, what they know, but you know, like to your point, they have to kind of tailor it around the talent yeah. that they have there and then eventually get the parts in there, that uh, uh, the players in there, that they, they want to run the sort of uh, strategy or, or scheme right. that they want to do. So. I, I think it's certainly a fine line, but also I think it's extremely important uh, that they understand um, what kind of athletes they can get based mm -hmm. where they are regionally when they get them, and the fact is, do you try to get an athlete to run a certain offense, or do you go get the best athlete? This is a question that goes at yeah. the highest level in the NFL, uh, for whatever it's worth, since we're in this beautiful Atlanta Falcons stadium, obviously mm -hmm. our home to Atlanta Falcons mm -hmm. stadium. Is the fact um, you hear that question come all up when you talk about draft day, mm -hmm. and uh, I think uh, uh, in, in regards to that, look, do you go for the best, at, you know, person available or specific to a position? Right, and yeah. I think those organizations of people that have found out how to have the best at this have figured out that they often go for the best player and tailor the system about. It situating his attributes. Yeah, and we, we, we've yeah. looked at that especially with Bramlin because uh, kind of their recruiting strategy has been to go out and go get the best player. I mean, I'm, I'm looking through their roster and, you know, they have, through, the, through the, just the defense alone, nine uh, players who mm -hmm. transferred uh, either from a, an FBS program or a junior college uh, that, that are all right in the playing mix on the defensive side of the ball. On the offensive side of the ball, seven players, either uh, coming from the FBS ranks or from junior college uh, ranks. So, you know, with their, their, with their recruiting strategy, you see it is to get the best the best player available or the best player who they can bring in who kind of fits yeah. what they want to do. Yeah, for, and for me, the bigger picture is bringing the right players in, getting the buy-in, but for Coach Broadway, his biggest challenge was the co that C-word, culture. Mm. They were under uh, sanctions for low graduation rate. Mm. No, in so reduced practice mm. times, things like that, reduced facility exposure. So not only was he able to recruit the right kid, but he had to change the culture of the organization. And for one man to do that uh, speaks to his ability, his capability, but that's a tremendous challenge. And now we're talking about what we're talking about, where he's bringing the right kids in yeah. into the right, and establishing the right system. So it's kind of what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Do you work on the culture? Or do you bring the right individuals? Or uh, it just amazes me his approach. Four time, uh, Coach Fives has been in SWAC four years. All four years he's been SWAC uh, uh, Coach of the Year. Yeah, certainly. This is Dr. Bill's Inside yeah. HBC Sports Edition with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop, for a special road edition mm -hmm. here for the Celebration Bowl 2017. Here in Atlanta, Georgia. It's supposed to be hot in Atlanta, but it is cold. <laughs> it is cold in Atlanta. Oh, yeah. oh, frosty in Atlanta. <laughs> 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 Somebody opened up the refrigerator and <laughs> Exactly. The brand new Mercedes <laughs> Benz Stadium. I will say this I'm glad that we are in a dome with covered roof. I know yes. they can, uh, will be able to eventually open this thing up. There's some questions about uh, when they will do that, but I know it certainly won't be today. And yeah. I thank you for that. <laughs> Malik A.J. Smith has joined us, Nicholas S. Howard. 
uh, uh, joined us in terms of that. And we have a couple of other comments for Jimmy and Tina will get in that. But I want to say that this is going to be a two hour blast of information. Um, so we won't take any commercial breaks. We're going to keep the numbers going. Yep. So stay with us, people, and we certainly appreciate what you joining us. Uh, with that, Jimmy said Coach Broward still runs the ball 60, 70% of, of the time. I don't think it's that high no, this year. No, mm, I don't think so. No. Generally speaking, it was. I think he's a little off on that, no, Jimmy. No, no. Yeah. This year, you'd be surprised that he has opened okay. up uh, and allowed Lamar actually to throw the ball. We'll get you a percentage on that, but I'm quite sure it's quite lower than 60%. Tina says records are good, but with this game, the records are thrown out the window. That's why you play the, the game. She's a good, but that's certainly why you play the game in that nature. And you're absolutely right in terms of this game. Uh, the way these players have talked about it and got into it, not in a negative way, but you can just say the competitive spirit, right. this game is going to be good. Uh, some of the comments that were made by both of the teams were saying in a lot of ways, and you can tell when you have additional teams, they said mm -hmm. this game is going to turn down and come down to – uh, people getting it done in the um, in terms of turnovers. Mm -hmm. Whoever makes the fewest mistakes yes. mm -hmm. doesn't really turn the ball over. Will actually uh, out, be come out the winner of this game. And so, team, in that perspective, I certainly agree with you in terms of what's going on. Mike, how many times a game does AT pass run? Same question for uh, Graham. And so mm -hmm. we'll get into some numbers. Yeah. You got any, any of that in front of you? But uh, see if you can pull that information out. Mm -hmm. Jimmy wants to know uh, as he starts yeah. to continue to do his evaluation. So we're going to ask, near the end of the show, we're going to ask these people to chime in to uh, provide them their thoughts on who's going to come out the win. And then obviously as we close out, we'll give you our pick that we've kind of been hitting on all week uh, in terms of that. Yep, Tina said Mumford. I knew we were going to have to make sure Man, we get that. Michael Lee has joined us. He said, what's up, Jafus? Yes, yes. You know, Mike knows. He go back. To the <laughs> Herman Shelton, ice cold. <laughs> First day of out there like this old Mike. One of them might make a good head coach. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I think you're right, these offensive coordinators. Because there's been some talk uh, in back behind the scenes. Some people believe Broadway is going to retire mm. uh, after this game, yeah. particularly if he gets the W. I'm not sure, based on what I've heard, that he seems happy about the fact that he has North Carolina. a and is one of the obviously best HBCU programs, but certainly one of the best FCS programs out there. And he likes the fact that he doesn't want to take a seat, back seat to anybody. Right. So I think he's enjoying what he's doing. I think he knows that he has. He's at a good place. He has the ability to recruit good players, and he mm -hmm. has coordinators that uh, are basically going to stick with him unless some truly big opportunity comes. So I think he feels good what's going on. So it's hard to imagine for me to see him return. So we'll kind of keep an eye on that for you and see what's going on there. Did you get any of that information? You still uh, yeah, digging give me a quick second. Yeah. Well, it's something to be said for just whooping on folks, and I think Coach Broadway likes to do that. <laughs> 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 something to be said for that. So people like to win. Yeah, <laughs> he said this woman on folks, and, and he has done that at least. Uh, and so we also have how you how the young kids will respond today will will be key. Also, Grandma is used to this type of bright lights atmosphere, whereas anti players are used are used to playing in uh, this type of venue uh, atmosphere. Uh, I don't believe that A and T actually played in this game two years ago. Yeah, yeah, they were. Uh, so they've been in. They, they inaugurated. So they've been here, and you can tell the way they come in. They're very calm, mm -hmm. collected. So I think uh, you you're mistaken a little bit if you if you think Grambling is the only one that's played in big time games like this. Uh, you also have to remember that A and T has consistently played FBS programs, mm -hmm. and they won in those games. So they're going into some tough territory where people are not expecting them to win. And people are bringing them in there as a paid game. So the fans come to the game because their bands come a lot of times. Sure. So they play in some rapid uh, games that North Carolina Central uh, has been a huge game. And it's played on campus. Yeah. So you have crowded teams, everybody, where you can't move on the sideline. And for the last three or four years, that game has decided essentially who would win the conference in over the last – Three years, also uh, last two years of last, because basically A&T had it wrapped up this year. Mm -hmm. But it talked about who was actually going to the celebration bowl. Mm -hmm. So they experienced the letdown of losing that game, and they were fortunate two years ago get the tiebreaker. 
and found a way to get in here. And a lot of people said the same thing about a and not being used to the lights. And Tariq Cohen literally showed out in the lights. 295 yards in the lights. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's Tariq Cohen. became an NFL prospect right. if he wasn't already, but certainly after that mm-hmm. game. Uh, and then they lost last year, so they put a lot of work to get back here. Mm-hmm. So I think you uh, sh- cut your sword short a little sh- uh, sh- self a little shorter, Aggies at least short, if you believe that they're not ready for the yeah. big lights. What do you think? Uh, real real about? quick comparison. We were talking about whether North Carolina A&T passes more or do they run more this year. Well, in 2016, if you kind of do the fair, and I even went back to 2015, if you look at their passing offense, they were somewhere 200 yards per game. Mm passing offense and a little bit less in 2015. If you look at their rushing offense this year, they're somewhere at 200 yards per game this year. Mm-hmm. Okay? That is actually less than what they rushed when they had Tariq Cohen. With Tariq Cohen, they were averaging 250, 260 yards mm-hmm. per game. Mm-hmm. So their rushing has gone down, their passing has gone up. Mm-hmm. Yes, and that's what, so, that's what we're saying it. Uh, winning that number, so thank you for sharing that. Mm-hmm. Hopefully that answers uh, the question for Jimmy there a little more. Then uh, Tina actually chimes back in and says, uh, agreeing the point that you made out there with the transfer, mm-hmm. says that's why Grambling is successful because the transfers fit into our system. Not every transfer has made it at Grambling True. in Grambling's system, mm-hmm. and King K is a perfect fit for Grambling. No question, great point that you make there, Tina. Uh, it's also making sure that those transfers are fit, and that's why I said that they figured that out in terms of the recruiting of what does a good transfer look like. Mm-hmm. And so their percentage of making mistakes, mm-hmm. as she alluded to, that everyone hasn't made it, is very low, well, which is significant, particularly in this time with APR, is that you can't afford to make mistakes uh, at any level right. and be successful. Yeah. And then I think it helps that grandma has name credibility or name recognition. Absolutely. You're, you're coming Absolutely. into a, a culture of winning. Uh, so yeah, you, but you I think, you I, to your yourself. point, I think that is true over all they do, mm-hmm. but let's make sure that we give credit to five from the standpoint that they were down in the gym right. yeah. for their went the quote-unquote negative news. Right. And I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, so I'm not bringing it up, but I think it's the fact of a uh, point that we had to look at yeah. that he knew that there was the the Grambling or the G history there, mm-hmm. but he quickly got it back up right. to winning, right. where then it becomes again where you can use that in terms of the culture, the, right? The right. culture part of it, but he had to change that, right? Yeah. Yeah. I tell you, yeah, we're talking about Grambling bringing on transfer. North Carolina and T is taking their few, their share. Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, said it, and, and I yeah. it was over five. Yeah, they got, they got, they got five in the mix there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. On Auburn society, right, right. So which tells you yeah. a little something about playing at this high no, level right. FCS that you can't not let any rock unturned, as Very we say, right? right? That you need to go any and everywhere that you can get the talent, right? And find a way to get in schools. One thing I always like to do and tell about this is because a lot of fans will take this and say, All right, well, let me go to my coach and my AD and say, Well, why are we not getting transfers? Every school is not built the same. Mm-hmm. You do have to make sure that uh, academically that your school has programs or you know degrees that allow for transfers to come in because you still have the APR uh, rules that require students that come in to have to move towards graduation and to be eligible whatever level they transfer in as a freshman. Well, you're not transferring in as a freshman, but as a junior, uh, excuse me, sophomore, junior, or senior. Mm-hmm. Uh, that you have to be at that sophomore, junior, and senior level towards graduation, hmm. or you're not eligible to play. So you must have degree fits that uh, that allow players to come in for them, and sometimes it means degree programs that have enough electives to allow them to transfer in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I want to make sure that we make that point. And before we go back yeah. to you all for some more remarks, and we start going a little more, and we talked about North Carolina A&T offense, Let's go a little more into the Grambling defense in terms of perspective. Since that's the side of the ball, we'll match up. And then, obviously, on the second half of the show, we'll reverse that and look at it from the other perspective. Okay. Uh, but want to uh, shout out to Michelle Richardson. She says, what's up, Doc? I'm good here. That's Dr. Michelle Richardson at Alabama A&M. She gets in here. Julia Askew, former president of the National Association of Texas Southern University. She's in the house there. Uh, as we have graduation 
a lot of our HBCUs this weekend, including Texas Southern, mm -hmm. because I brought students here, graduate students here. I'm not at graduation there, but just wanted to give a t shout out to all the HBCU graduates, which particularly the Texas Southern University graduates, if you would. Um, Casey says, I'm not impressed with uh, A&T offensive uh, they're out of conference schedule. I don't know why you're not uh, well, with that. Well, to yeah. this point, um, FBS, uh, they played Charlotte. Charlie. Charlotte yeah. is only one win FBS team. Uh, Garden Webb, one win FCS yes. team. And Mars Hill is Division Two team. So I heard that, you know, that sort of but uh, I think, commentary from the SWAC side. Mm -hmm. I think I think at the end of the day, that's just, again, you're looking at it from a SWAC perspective. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We played, uh, yeah. what was it, Northwestern that – who did Grambling beat out of uh, the Southland Conference? Northwestern no, State, I believe. Yeah, State. what was their record? Yeah, it wasn't good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the question, the point is, is when you play teams, what did you do? Mm -hmm. You won. Yeah, right. so that's what you need to do. And they beat these teams pretty solidly as well over the years. Yeah. So, I think sometimes we get ourselves in trouble when we don't give credit where credit is due and just say, all right, we have a solid team. Yeah. But to say you're in not impressed, you dismiss teams, and if you're not careful, you're going to find out what we find in the locker room yeah. where them players are playing for respect. Yeah. And you don't, you want to let sleeping dogs <coughs> lie. Yes, in this case, the Aggie pride dogs <laughs> lie. Hey. There's a child to wake them up, and, and they're going to come in there and punch <laughs> you in the mouth. We've seen the <laughs> offensive <laughs> fight and the size Woo. of the ante yeah. uh, coming into the building, so you can believe hey. that they ain't got no talent on that side of the football. They look the part. You <laughs> They looked the part. You're going to be sorely lacking. <laughs> yes, and I'm is. not saying that Grandma can't win this football game. And, again, I'm not giving the indication where I'm going to go with this because you'll get my picks at the end of the show. You're going to have to stay tuned in to get that, mm -hmm. as we call it a teaser in the business. But I do want to make it clear that these are two very solid football teams. Mm -hmm. and if you think any of these teams are going to blow out the other team, no. I don't no. see it. Right, right. Yeah, yeah I, I don't look for a high scoring game today. Especially in the first half. I think you yeah. get a little more yeah, score in the second half. I, I right. think, They're yeah. going to play it close to the vest yeah. the first half, and then you'll see them, as these good coaches do, they'll go in the rock, locker room and really look yeah. for some cracks in the vest, and you'll see them try to exploit that, and they will be able to exploit it to some degree. But I think you'll see that on both It'll sides. It'll be interesting to see what the defensive halftime is. Now uh, we be. see the I'm Aggies sorry. on the field. Right. Uh, they're in their pads, yep. uh, at least uh, the bottoms, uh, without their tops on as they're getting out here slinging the football, doing some kicks and things of that nature, just to give you updates yep. on what's going on in the field. Uh, we have some of our colleagues coming in here. They getting ready. Don mm -hmm. Ware is going to be calling the game for A and T. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Box and roll guys in here right next to us. We got Carlos doing his thing, and so mm -hmm. you start to see people come in here and get ready uh, to throw this game. So it'll be mm -hmm. interesting. Is it's starting to liven up a little yeah, bit? Yeah, it is. Hey, hey, hey Doc, Doc, Doc yeah. in this football bill. Doc, I gave you a compliment about how debonair you look, but they kind of they kind of stepped up. I'm just saying. I'm really just saying. Because somebody put on the panels too Obviously, obviously <laughs> you've started something. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly right. Oh, my little shit. Yeah, they don't call me Doctor Neil, the Dabble Doctor, the Sports Professor, nothing. Uh, uh, and uh, y'all keep it coming. I'm coming out with a line so y'all can get on with the professor line. So look for that coming shortly as well. <laughs> but uh, any more thoughts, in, your thoughts in terms of uh, some of these comments where we don't really go inside the number. That's why we wanted to do this show mm -hmm. is to go inside the number so you're just not uh, talking about what's out there because you want to support your team. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you started talking about the grandma defensive line. And this is, this is I think – is where you've really got to watch this game. You're talking about one of the best defensive lines in the SWAC, uh, one of the top defenses in FCS football. Uh, they lead the nation in sacks, 43 sacks coming mm -hmm. into this game, going against one of the best offensive lines in the nation. And not only are they one of the best offensive lines, uh, Brandon Parker, I think, is, is a day one draft pick. Uh, in terms of, when I say day one, I mean, First three rounds. I mean, he's he is a huge man. Yeah. Has not given up a sack yeah, thus day far. One, day two, right? Exactly. Sure. And, then, and, and he slid slide up to the day one, right? And 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 then you talk about continuity. They they have three guys that have been uh, four year starters for North Carolina A&T. So, yeah, yeah. And, and a and has lot has allowed fewer sacks. If you look at the cross comparison, 
So their offensive line is, is no slack as well. Um, the two, the number that stands out to me on the upper, we always talk about Martez Carter and, and Devontae Kincaid, but if you look at uh, Markel Cartwright and Lamar Raynard, they have combined those two for 300, uh, 3,787 yards of the total 4,700 yards. So the greatest majority of their yardage, their total offense has been through those two individuals. Mm -hmm. So you look at the comparison. Quarterback, running back, quarterback, running back. We talk a lot about Kincaid, but we don't talk as much about Lamar Raynard. Mm -hmm. and so I think it'll be interesting how, which two can come out the most um, and bring the most productivity, at least in the second half of the game. I do agree. The first half, I think both teams will be nervous, but it'll be interesting to see which two, which dynamic duel will be able to assert their offensive capabilities in the second half. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Well, I want to go into this Tiger defense yeah. as we talked about, so I'm going to get out some names okay. and some size and, and some places so we can talk about who they're going up on this offensive line side of A&T as we start to get into these trenches. This is what you're looking up front for the Texas Southern Tigers, I mean, excuse me, the Groundland State Tigers uh, defense here. Defensive end, Brandon Barnum, 6'4", 255-pound junior. He's out of Atlanta. Kip Atlanta High School uh, as, as he gets it done uh, as the starter uh, walking in this game. Nose guard, you have Linwood Banks, 6'1", 290-pound junior, Alexandria, uh, Louisiana, Peabody High School. And then you have the defensive line as they played at 3-4, essentially. Um, you have Anthony Mullen, 6'4", 270-pound, red shirt sophomore out of Aliceville, Alabama, Mississippi State transfer uh, there. Uh, and then we get into their linebacker core, offensive line, outside linebacker, I should say, excuse me, DeAndre Hobbs, I hope I pronounced that right, 6'2", mm -hmm. 215-pound sophomore from Mobile, Alabama, John L. LaFleur High School, uh, Major League Base, uh, middle linebacker, uh, the Aries Christmas 5'10", 225 junior from Vicksburg, Mississippi, East Mississippi uh, Community College. Uh, and then you have uh, outside linebacker uh, Deontay Hatter, 6'1", 215-pound senior from Birmingham, Alabama. Boy, do they like to come to Birmingham and get to play in this. <laughs> George Washington Carver High School there. So yeah. that's what you have to deal with uh, when you're talking about that defensive front. And l l not let me forget uh, what they call the cat linebacker, Percy Cargo, who is 6'2", 210-pound junior, Donaldsville, Louisiana, uh, Donaldsville High School there. Tackling machines here. They are gap control guys, mm -hmm. and they funnel um, their the players into uh, their linebackers who exactly. make yep. tons of tackles. Makes tons yep. of tackles in terms of that. So this is a defense that is lightning quick. Yep. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily the biggest size, mm -hmm. but they're light on their feet. They know how to move around, and they make plays. And they are an attacking defense. Yes. Mm. They go at you and penetrate. Mm -hmm. They do not like to see you get off the ball and push them in different directions. They will come at you and scheme in such a way where they look to get in and disrupt plays before they really get going. And so they'll find a way in your backfield mm -hmm. if you're not careful Very much and so. make your life miserable. Yes, indeed. Uh, so don't get it twisted. This type of defense is solid. Uh, top in the conference yes. in terms of what they're doing, and top in the nation mm -hmm. uh, to let you know that they're a certainly a great quality there. Well, you're talking about Darius Christmas. He's a swag defensive player of the year, uh, middle linebacker. You talk about making tons of plays for uh, the Grandma's defense. Uh, Christopher Johnson, Brandon Barlin, they both were all swag uh, defensive players. Uh, you're talking about a top-notch defensive mm -hmm. line, and I think one of the matchups you're really going to have to watch today is the Mississippi State transfer, Anthony Mullins, going up against Brandon Parker. We didn't see Mullins really until the Prairie View game, where he made an impact in the Prairie View game, but uh, this is a guy who can get off the ball. Like I said, if this defensive line, they come at you, they blitz, they uh, defensive line does a lot of work without the blitz, mm -hmm. but that's why they lead the, the uh, nation in sacks, 43 sacks coming into this game. And they mm -hmm. pound you when they get this. Yeah. I've seen one yes, play. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> when the guy came and just swang him out, I always thought he should have gotten <laughs> And we know when that he was really bad, you might say a little bit of face mask. But he did it so quick, the referee couldn't even see it. Yeah. Just threw him like a cat. 
it's in the way. Mike, what do you think about this Grambling defense? Yeah, I think I think uh, I, just to add on what you do that that they move around quick. They in the military they have what you call kind of a mobile defense, a mobile quick strike defense. Mm. However, if I'm looking at the offensive line of A and T, they're not big heavy linemen. They average six two, uh, maybe two hundred and ninety pounds, and they've allowed the fewest sacks in the MEAC. Now you might say maybe it's the competition. But that sack, comparison to the number two, three, four, or five, is an order of magnitude 10 times difference. So that tells me that that offensive line is not as big as your t typical offensive line. If you look at Brand uh, Brandon Parker, Joshua Patrick, if you look at them across their offensive line, they've allowed fewer sacks. Brandon, right, and, and I think that's the so matchup that'll be the that matchup. we get off, especially when you look at Brandon Parker, yeah. and he's uh, taking on Brandon, Brandon yeah. Varner, or he's taking on Anthony Mullins. Uh, you're talking about 6 7 versus 6 4 Sport. matchup, uh, 309 versus 270, 270, or 6 4, 255. Yeah. But don't get twisted in the size because we're talking about the speed. Right. So I think what you're going to want to see from North Carolina and T, they're going to want to get into you mm. and control you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And push you back uh, in terms of what's going on there. You're going to want to see Gramlin want to get in there quick, get them on their heels, mm. and keep them yeah. guessing as they're moving, doing spins. Going inside, twists, stunts to get around the outside. Mm -hmm. to, will A and T take the uh, discipline and try to run up the middle while they're moving around them? And how do you have these getching matches where you're going to see these linebackers blitz up there when they're doing these spin yeah. offs well, trying to yeah, go inside? But, yeah, so I think that's going to be an interesting match. But the, 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 the chess game, match right, when right, But right. Brandon Parker is six seven. Everybody else on that line is six two, six three. So do they focus on him when they need to run? Do they move him around a little bit? Do they keep him there? No, the, I think they just stay on the left top. Yeah. Uh, but I think your point is is that they're going to run towards the side, side as yeah. much as possible. But I think it's going to be interesting because the other thing that you got to look at defensive side of the ground is the fact that they rotate. They go 8, 11 deep yep. uh, on that side of the ball in terms of the guys up front. So they'll be fresh. In yes. regards to that. So that's something else that you want to look at is they like to rotate a lot of people out there, keep them fresh and keep them attacking as I'm talking about, mm -hmm. which is going to be intriguing to say. How does that match up uh, in terms of it? Can you get them maybe in some penalties as they're trying to make those switches? Uh, as a guy comes in and out, do you run to his side to kind of before he gets time to kind of jail? I think those are some other questions you want to look at in terms of those things. Any other comments before we start to switch around and look at the other side of the ball? Well, like you said, um, uh, Brandon Parker is just certainly impressive. Uh, Seven-time MEAC Offensive Lineman of the Week. He's yep. the MEAC Offensive uh, uh, Lineman of the Year. Uh, that's just going to be a fun matchup to watch, but you, you flip it on the uh, opposite, opposite side. side. We talk about a and offensive line quite a bit, Bingo. but Brandon has a couple of all swag selections yeah. on offensive not line. Not yet, not yet. Yeah. I want, we're going to get on that side uh -huh. of the ball. I want us to make sure that we yeah. Tie in these loose ends in terms of the Brown State Tigers defense against this offensive mm -hmm. line. And then we'll get in there and as we kind of take this break here, I'll bring in this news. Uh, this would be pleasure to the ears <laughs> of Brown State. Breathe a little easier. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of people either had the rumor of wanting them down there, and obviously Chad said this early, he's not going anywhere. But this certainly solidifies it as Louisiana Lafayette. The Billy Napier's deal is a five-year deal worth a maximum first-year compensation of $1.47 million, including bunny mo bunny, excuse me, bonus money per tweet from Yahoo's Pat Ford. His assistant salary pool will also be the largest in the Sun Belt by far. That is coming from Michael Lee. Again, for those fans out there, the yeah. Gramlin, uh, it looks like you're going to be safe with the coach yeah. that continues what? to get it done. They didn't even consider uh, fives that type or with that type of money, and I believe you're right, which is unfortunate. Uh, obviously, we love to see our coaches stay, build our programs, but you also want to be in a position where coaches feel they can come in and take other programs as well, because that's just the way business is done these days. Sure. And so, if you're going to get some of the better coaches, you have to be prepared for them to leave. Sometimes you do have the natural fit, which could be the case with fives. And I tell you this, though, if he finds a way to win this game, before we switch over to talk about this, the Grambling folks need to make sure they can come out of their pocket and pay this man. I mean, you got 
not just because you want to pay the man, but you don't want to be in a position every time you're looking at that his name is out there. And he even little. thinks twice about it because financially it's better for his family Yeah, uh, from that perspective. Because uh, we have what essentially four or five coaches out there in the HBCU program mm -hmm. that are now making $300,000 or more. Yes, yes. And so, he's reported at making one seventy five yeah. under two. Yeah, you need to kind of reach in your wallet a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> you, you just, just a little bit. Yeah, man, you want to just feel, a little you want bit. To feel the love. Now. <laughs> I, I'm just saying, Kevin Martindale is joining in. Lawrence yeah. McCall, we played the introduction song there and gave you some love, Tabby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Martindale says he's staying with the SWAT. He said, let's go SWAT. I am TJ is watching. Appreciate you joining uh, Barty is still charming in there getting it done. Dr. Kabil, Jimmy, Jimmy, I have your answer in just a minute. Jimmy asked me a follow-up question about the A&T offense, defense. He wanted per-game attempts, so I have a few numbers. And yeah. I would be remiss if Kim, my wife, Kimberly Washington, said we all three are looking good. So. Oh, appreciate it. <laughs> I told you. I told you. I know I did. Hey, speak for yourself, man. I didn't speak for myself. I said, I. Oh, okay. I was like, oh. she said we all look yeah. good. Yeah. Right. <laughs> My sister, she, she, she right. Yeah. So, uh, did you get those numbers for Jimmy? Yeah, I'm finishing up uh, real quick. He had a very valid point, so let me finish up. The other thing is, we they said we, to be yeah. correct. Fobbs is at 195k plus. So, still right under two number. <laughs> you better get them incentives up. Uh, uh, wow. Hey, I'm just saying. <laughs> He said it. Casey Price said it. We need to get files up to 300K. That's what we're talking about. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have a coach doing this kind of thing for your program, right. cash and fluent. And look what it's doing in terms of uh, not just this game, but playing this game, increasing the overall enrollment at Grambling, yeah. which is very important, and kudos for them in terms of what's doing, uh, in terms of that enrollment coming up. That's very solid for a very proud and historic institution that's done a lot of great work of pro producing uh, solid citizens and, and difference makers, to be frank with you, in yeah. terms of, of the world wide over. That's just what they do at Gramlin, and like many of our HBCU programs. So kudos to them. And then you talk about the football facility. Mm -hmm. uh, they have an upgrade in terms of new turf they were able to get done. And a lot of that's due to the success of the football program. Uh, also, a new scoreboard, is my understanding, they put in, in the facility. There. So they're doing great work, and they're allowing the money that comes out of playing in this game it is coming back and not just to the institution operationally, but it's going specifically in football as well as other sports, which I think is That's important. Key. Yeah. That yeah. you don't always see that mm -hmm. you make sure yep. that yeah. if a uh, sport is generating revenue, that they get it back to continue to do, do great work. So I think that's extremely important as well as some of the things out there in terms of in terms of what's going on. Any other thoughts before we get in here and start to do that? Uh, mm -hmm. One question here, do you think Kincaid could be the next Drew Brees for the New Orleans Saints? other teams on the next level. I think uh, one of the things, he, he, he should get a shot, uh, but one of the things you're going to want to look at Kincaid is can he get that accuracy up? Yeah. In the NFL, one of the mm -hmm. things that they always look for, whether you agree with it or not, is in terms of uh, being able to do the accuracy in terms of that, that nature. Um, and I'm going to throw it back to you so we can get this pen for you, Mike. We'll, we'll get yep. you something there. Mm -hmm. So, Charles, what are your thoughts on Kincaid? Uh, specifically going to the next level, but in this case, Drew Brees and New Orleans. Well, huh. I, I think uh, definitely Kincaid will get a, an opportunity at least. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, uh, Howard brings up uh, is with, with the comparison to Drew Brees, of course, Drew Brees coming to the NFL, yeah, there was all sorts of questions about his height, and I think you'll kind of get the same thing with Kincaid in terms of he's not, you know, uh, six, you know, prototypical looking quarterback, six one, six two, one of those type of quarterbacks. Uh, uh, Kincaid's a five ten, five eleven, somewhere in, in that range. So, you know, the, the questions about his height. You mentioned uh, accuracy, things of that nature. So, uh, but I think he should have given an opportunity at least on the next level. KC yeah. Price gives gives us some more information that I certainly want to share to people out there that may, uh, in terms of this point. He says the incentives put um, Coach Fobbs well over 200K. Keep in mind that he took his raise money that would have taken his base to 250K 
and gave it to his sisters. Kudos for Fives doing that. Right. And that tells you a lot about the man right. in right. regards to that. Um, that's that special. You don't always yeah. see that mm-hmm. where coaches um, will Whoa. take it on themselves versus spreading the love. Right. So, Casey, I appreciate you uh, giving that information because that does uh, tell you a little bit something about Fives in general as we continue to see and hear, but also gives you a different perspective in terms of what's taking on there. Definitely. Uh, Lauren said, thanks for enlightening us, us on HBC Sports. I like how you are bringing this uh, information to the forefront. HBC Sports is the best because the student athletes pay with passion, with uh, little compensation and the lack of national endorsement. Great job, brothers. Appreciate that uh, Lawrence McCall in terms of bringing uh, light to that. And that's, that's really why we do this. This is our passion for this, uh, to do this, to make sure that uh, these players, these HBCU institutions, uh, get the due respect they should get in terms of getting the limelight in terms of all the information they right. uh, in regards to that job that is going on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just wanted to say good job in regards to that information there. Yeah. Uh, so Mike, you have some different information. You have. Some yeah, Jimmy asked about a, a a and it's a very question a per game attempt, and if and if you look at and if you look at actual attempts per season. Um, going back to 2015, uh, North Carolina A&T rushed the ball, attempts, just straight attempts, 529 times, 2015. 2016, dropped to 500. 2017, 446. So their rushing attempts have declined slightly over to flip the script. In, 2000, in 2015, they attempted to pass the ball 219 times. And in 2016, I was pu- pulling it up, it went up to 250. And in 2017, it's jumped up to 300, 301 to be exact. Wow. So their passing attempt has gone up, mm-hmm. and their rushing attempts have gone down. So the offense, total offense has equalized between rushing attempts and passing attempts. Yeah, and it kind of goes against the identity of what we think of in the swag as MIAC football in terms of uh, this past season, at least with North Carolina A&T, in terms of uh, running the ball, running the ball, yeah. running the ball constantly. They've opened it up a lot more this year. And like I said mm-hmm. uh, earlier, uh, Lamar Raynard, uh, Raynard has actually thrown for more yards than Devontae Kincaid. So, you know, it's yeah. like when that stat just kind of really jumped out at me, like, wow. And, and the numbers in terms of attempts, mm-hmm. uh, per se, they back that up, that they're passing the ball a little bit more than they have over the, the, la- the past couple of years. So, Jimmy, I hope that helps you out. A little bit. You keep asking me where's my numbers, and if you give me a few more minutes, I can break it down by game if you'd like. <laughs> wow. Right. So let's look at this offensive side since we're mm-hmm. talking about Grambling, uh, Devontae Kincaid. Let's go a little more in terms of the offensive Grambling, what they've done it all year long. And I want to give some love to the players here and give you what is projected as their starting lineup uh, in regards to that. Obviously, without uh, do. Further ado is Devontae Kincaid, quarterback 6'1", 190-pound senior out of Dallas, Texas, uh, transfer from the University of Mississippi. Uh, he won the Big Ben HBCU Football Award, mm-hmm. uh, yep. Ben L. Cavill HBCU Football Award a uh, couple of weeks ago. He is the two-time winner of the award. This is the third time we've given the award in terms of that, and um, he was taking it away. Those that are not familiar with the award, it is – award that is given to an HBCU player, the best HBCU player that has a connection to the state of Texas. And when we say a connection to the state of Texas, um, there are a couple of ways that you can make that connection. And it is if you were born in the state of Texas, and again, you play football at HBCU, or if you went to a high school program uh, and played football and went to an HBCU, played football, uh, or even a JUCO college mm-hmm. in the state of Texas and play for HBCU, you are connected. If you're from out of the state of Texas, you still can be eligible if you played for one of the HBCUs in the state of Texas, mm-hmm. Prairie View, Texas Southern, mm-hmm. and let us not forget Texas College as well that play, has a football program mm-hmm. there too. So those are the ways that you can uh, be eligible for this award. We do this award to raise money to provide scholarship dollars for our students um, that uh, are looking or maybe having some financial uh, ramifications of getting back into school to finish up. And in fact, we were able to give our first award this year 
to Demetrius Gatewood, mm -hmm. and it is timely that he's just signing on and checking this out. So sh shout out Demetrius Gatewood as he came to the banquet and was surprised. I didn't let him know. I told him he came, mm -hmm. and to his credit, he didn't ask one question. He found a way to be there uh, <laughs> and brought his significant friend, and so I got a chance to tease her a little bit and, and tell him that uh, let me know if Demetrius she has any problems with the meat. <laughs> and I will take care of it. So kind of kick out of that. Uh, and so what exactly are you going to do? <laughs> that, that's where you ask for too much business. I don't take care of it. Family, it's family I'm business. Just, it's family business. I'm just asking. Don't ever ask the Godfather what the Godfather is going to do. Thank you. Thank you. So, Thank you. so but let's go back into some of these players. All right, so let's go to this line. They don't always get the love that they should get. Uh, so we talked, obviously, a lot about that uh, depth chart on the offensive line of A&T. Now it's time to get in that Grammar yep. uh, State offensive line. We talked about the quarterback here, but who are the guys that protect? Left tackle, you have Trenton Scott, 6'5", 320-pound, redshirt senior from Huntsville, Alabama, Lee High School. Uh, left guard, we talked about them going into Alabama. Yeah. Birmingham, and now they're sneaking up to Huntsville. Boy, those Alabama A&M Bulldogs, that will be you just uh, 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 Everybody come in your back. They better learn place. to protect the border. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I tell you. So they say, put a fence around Put a fence around Left guard is Daryl Brown, 6'2", 325 pounds, junior. We talked about these boys big. Mm -hmm. Atlanta, Georgia, Georgia Prep Sports Academy. Another guy out of Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. from yep. They recruit nationally. If that be said, center DeAndre Sims, 5'11", 300 pounds, sophomore, Port St. Louis, Florida, Port St. Louis, uh, Port Louis St. Louis High School. Right guard is William Waddell, 6'2", 335 pounds, sophomore, Tallahassee, Florida, from Lee High, High School. Man, look at that. Uh, just on that offensive line, right tackle Kyle Davis, 6'4", 305 pounds. Freshmen, they have this is where we thought they might have some problems with the youth they had, but they yeah. handled it very well, very solid. All of them over 300 pounds, but they can move uh, in terms of that. And look uh, where these players are from Huntsville, Alabama, Atlanta, Georgia, Port St. Louis, Florida, Tallahassee, Florida, and Monroe, Louisiana. Not to mention that you have the tight end that also stays in as a blocking tight end at times and can. Uh, be a threat down the field, so don't be surprised about tight end Jordan Jones at 6'2", 260-pound, redshirt sophomore from Frisco, Texas, Lone Star High School. Talk a little bit about this offensive line. Let's go and start with you, Mike. What are your thoughts on this offensive line for Grambling? Some of this you've seen up close in person. Yeah, and, and big kudos to William Waddell and uh, Trent Scott, their uh, first team uh, all swag. So that get, tells you a little bit about their capability, but if you look at statistics and sacks allowed against the team, that gives you another indication that this, this group can protect. Now you have Kincaid who's very mobile, but he's also, he's also number two, he's, he fluctuated between number two, number three in the swag and passing. Mm -hmm. So there's times he backs back and needs protection, and that gives you an indication just by the sack number that these guys do a great job of protecting. They're big guys, but they're obviously pretty mobile. So uh, big kudos to them. That two, I guess what, one half of the first the SWAC first team mm -hmm. uh, linemen yeah. belong to Grambling. Yeah, and uh, you know, like you said, William Waddell, Trent Scott. One of the things I really noticed about Grambling is fourth quarter they they, they tend to wear you down a little yeah. bit, <laughs> and uh, it, it opens up holes for Martez Carter, Martez mm -hmm. Carter. Of course, uh, Mr. Excitement, they call him. I mean, he, oh, he yeah. gets it done uh, between the tackles in space, catching the ball out the backfield. And slide. He's a tremendous matchup problem. But that offensive line really is able to uh, count, uh, in a sense, uh, give you that yeah. meat feel because Ex for a quarter they kind of wear you down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I thought great analysis when you go in there and start talking about how a lot of these teams, these two teams, I should say, mirror each other. Obviously, these teams have been arguably the best two teams in black college football over the last couple mm -hmm. of years. Mm -hmm. uh, before we go into getting in these skilled players and talk about them on the offensive side of Gramlin, but you talk about the record between these two teams. Uh, Gramlin is 31 and 5 since March of 2015, while North Carolina A&T is 30 and 5 as well. Uh, I certainly would argue that these been the top two 
HBCU programs without in, question well, in the country. Easy. You're probably throwing all four in North Carolina Central, and you can make an argument for Southern or Prairie View to yeah. round out the top yeah. five yeah. in terms of what they've done over the last five years of at least being in the mix. No arguments uh, with that. Certainly goal. with. Thank you, certainly with uh, all four in the Central yeah. um, three and four because they played for a championship. I think edges out Southern and Prairie View on that side. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's interesting. You see those teams taking the next step, and uh, we'll get maybe to the next a little bit at the end. Will those teams be able to somehow leapfrog these two teams who have seen the final that this is their destination yeah. uh, over the last three years in terms of playing in this game? So uh, a little more in terms of that, just to give you an outside picture of these programs. Let's go into the um, skill positions. Let's start at the wide receiver first. Mm. And then we'll obviously give some major love to the running back, mm -hmm. Martez Carter, mm -hmm. who we've seen feature running backs play in this game that had a chance to really put their stamp on it. And I think Martez Carter has the ability to do that. We yeah. still see, see that mm -hmm. as he, uh, in a lot of ways, a difference maker, particularly in the Bayou Classic and to some degree in the championship game, at least in the first half. Mm -hmm. uh, wide receivers, though, these guys are young. But they are playing big time football. I get it. Uh, wide receiver, as they call it, the exposition is Quentin. Uh, I always forget. Quentin Dice. Quentin Dice. Dice. Yeah. 6'1, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, 190 pounds, sophomore from Monroe, Louisiana, Neville High School. Uh, you also have wide receiver Daryl Clark, 6' even, 180 pound junior from New Orleans, Louisiana, Warren Eastern High School. And then uh, wide receiver Devontae Davis, 6'2. 25 pound redshirt junior from Dallas, Texas, out of Kaplan High School. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about these wide receivers. These are guys that uh, make plays for Devontae KK when he puts that ball in there. Well, you're, you're talking about, uh, and from last year to this year, of course, uh, Devontae had Chad Williams, yes. uh, third round draft pick of the Arizona Cardinals. And for me, I thought it was going to be a, a, a natural drop off. Gremlin offense, I, but uh, the way they spread the ball around yes. to these receivers, uh, and they're all big play guys. We're talking uh, Daryl Clark, uh, Lindamian Brooks. You'll see him sometimes come out of the backfield. Uh, they motion him out quite a bit. Uh, uh, Devon Lindsay, he's yes. become a huge big play threat yes. for Gremlin. And I, you know, I, I'm not sure a t has seen this sort of explosion uh, uh, from an uh, offensive side of the ball. Uh, and in terms of the receivers, they're going to see it. Yeah, and, it, and their approach, it mirrors a and the, the number, the only swag for uh, the Gremlin receiver that's in the top ten is Daryl Clark. Mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. like number eight. But yet, they lead the, the swag in scoring. Mm -hmm. So it's spread, and he's spreading love. And so many defensives have focused on Devontae point, and also Martez Carter. But Mr. Lenz, who you adequately pointed out, mm -hmm. is a second – by, by all definitions, dual threat to right. Martez Carter. Right. So the ball is spread, and not, you also have multiple deep threats mm -hmm. uh, that can take it at any time and at any point in the game. Yeah, the shirt flowers is another one. You know, they, they just have threats, you know, waiting yeah. to get in the game. <laughs> <laughs> a great point when you talk about some of those guys sure. that will come in and get a lot of time. While these are your starters, you have the backups to come in and play solid amount of football that you need to keep mm -hmm. your eyes on. Guys like you said, Levon, Devon Lindsay, yeah. uh, Derek Pate, and Kobe Ross. To get in there. But the guy that I really want to give some special love to is Martez Carter. Yes, sir. Um, the 5'9, 25 pound senior, Monroe, Louisiana, Richwood High School. And just to be frank with you, a fan of Prairie View A&M University and a booster down there. Uh, the fact is, I've seen him just give prayer be over the hill. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. the swag oh as well. Yeah. <laughs> the rest of the swag. <laughs> you ain't the only one. <laughs> so uh, every time uh, I'm seeing a, a, a prayer view come up to Dallas, thinking they got a shot, uh, Martez yes. seems to go quickly and said, "No, nah, don't worry about that. Not so fast, my yeah. exactly. Next year. Exactly. So, um, but small in stature, but big in heart, big in mm -hmm. plays. Uh, hard to bring down, hard to see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, to kind of go back and let people know the history of this game, we've seen another small, quote unquote, the mini yes. guy come yeah. in this game and mm -hmm. shock the world literally right. yes. and put his stamp on the game. Uh, tell us a little bit about Mark, Mark uh, Tez Carter and does he have the ability to show off in this game? 
much like Tariq Cole. Very much so. Looking for him to have a big game. Um, uh, they call him Mr. Excitement. They call yeah. him Mr. Excitement for a reason. He's a home run threat, whatever he is yeah. on the field. Uh, we've seen him do it all throughout the SWAC in terms of, uh, you, you know, kind of uh, tipping the balance uh, for Grambling. But you're talking about uh, a kid who has rushed for uh, 900 yards, yeah. and he's also caught uh, uh, passes out of the backfield. He has 400 yards uh, receiving for Grambling as yeah. well. He is a, a big threat receiver, and you read a lot of scout notebooks uh, from guys around the NFL, in a lot of ways he compares so much to Tariq Cohen. Yeah, and, and if you just, I mean, the one stat that said all-purpose yards. Yes, all-purpose yards. All-purpose. He 14, 1,500 yards this year. There you go. All-purpose yards. That mm -hmm. is, you know, what can you say other than anytime he's on the field, he's almost as much of a decoy or value. He brings as much value as a decoy, right. considering how Grandling, you know, distributes the ball. Mm -hmm. They're going to focus on Martez. They may even put two people, you know, put somebody line up on him if he lines up in the slot and have somebody spy him. He frees right. up other people. He frees, yeah, up, frees up, other up other people. people so yeah. that that in and of itself yeah, makes it more of a threat than him actually with the ball. Right, right, exactly. And we open up with the question about the Devontae Kincaid, but he's the final piece of the puzzle. So mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to go back to him a little bit since then we do the cherry piece and get into the Aggies defense and what do you see against this offense of mm -hmm. what are some things that you need to consider when you're watching that matchup yeah. of this upfront line against this defensive line of the Aggies. Before we get into that defensive line, the key guy in this game in a lot of ways is Devontae Kincaid in terms of him deciding whether to throw the ball, run the ball mm -hmm. uh, with his feet to make plays, uh, as he has always found a way to stand plays. But obviously, the support he gets from Martez Carter. Talk a little bit about Devontae Kincaid and what has made him special. As I said earlier, obviously, I believe in his specialness because uh, he asked last year and really did a lot of job. To be frank with you, is to take the Big Ben trophy to the next level. He got out there and supported it, mm -hmm. took pictures with the Big Ben. He had the Big Ben trophy along with his Player of the Year trophy from the SWAC. So that says a lot about him really uh, saying that this was special right. and he made that award to the next level. And we got a chance this summer, I would add, as he was down for the media days as we went to that. and. Uh, we introduced ourselves, and he recalled and said, hey, you're the big man and all this. I said, and he asked the question, do I have a chance to win it again? Yeah. I said, well, you do the thing you did last year. <laughs> Without a doubt, I, I, there's no choice. Right. And he had five weeks. The only player came close to that was a three-week guy. Mm -hmm. That was the big man helmet trophy of the week uh, out of Texas for the award. So he really wanted going on the way. Right. So he's a special player in terms of what I see. But tell us a little bit about this. Uh, as we have the North Carolina Ants band marching into the stadium uh, right now. We'll see if we can get you some pictures out there for those uh, to let you know what's going on there uh, in terms of that. But go ahead. Yeah, um, like you said, special player. And, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about Grambling. We, we keep saying they just keep finding a way to get it done. And he's very much the 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 the, the, the the, the centrifuge, if you will, for that in terms of uh, the engine that makes the, the car go. Um, he just extends plays. Uh, I've, I, it, you talk about, he kind of has, uh, and you know, you have to be careful how you use this, but he has McNair qualities yes. in terms of being able to extend plays. It doesn't, uh, whenever you think he's in trouble, it kind of gets away, keeps his eyes downfield, uh, finds those receivers. And this year, I think he took his game to a, a different level in terms of spreading the ball, or spreading the ball around so many different uh, ball players. And to me, it makes him just that much harder to defend. Yeah. Certainly, Mike. Before you jump in here, Casey Price is excited about this. He's, the scary thing is, is that Kincaid hasn't really used his running ability uh, this year, and I agree with it. He yeah. says today is it, and he may go all out. And I think you're right, Casey Price, yeah, is that I, truly, I don't yeah. think any of these players are going to leave anything on the table. No, yeah. That's including Kincaid. He's been saving himself in a lot of ways and had the ability not to have to use his feet as much. Uh, but I think today, uh, I agree with you, Casey Price, that he will uh, let it all hang out. Yeah, I was <laughs> going to ask the question, if you're the A&T defense, what do you do against Kincaid? Well, you force him to 
beat you from the pocket. Several teams have tried that this year. Right. Now plays broken down, but I do agree that this will be the game that he'll try to use his legs. So I totally agree. I, I don't. I think he'll leave everything on the field, mm -hmm. just like several other players. But I mean, you try to keep him in the pocket. Try it. I mean, other teams have tried it, and just as you mentioned, Gramlin seems to find a way to get someone else involved and integral in that offense. He's the catalyst. Right. I've had, I've had the uh, defensive, a uh, couple of defensive coaches tell me with regard to Kincaid, you have to have a disciplined pa pass rush. Exactly. You know, because if you give up the edge, he'll burn you, mm -hmm. the things of that nature. So, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see how they, you know, attempt to attack Devontae Kincaid. Mm -hmm. Certainly. And uh, with that, I also want to talk a little bit more <laughs> about this front line of the defense as we start talking about that in the trenches matchup uh, between um, defensive end Kenneth Melton, uh, a 6'2", 235 redshirt senior from Elizabeth City, North Carolina. You have Jermaine Williams, 6'1", 301 pound redshirt sophomore from Lumberton, North Carolina. Julian McKnight, 6'3", 280 pound redshirt junior from Conyers, Georgia. Uh, this is defense, nose guard, defensive tackle, mm -hmm. and uh, the other defensive end is Daryl Johnson, 6'5", 226 pound redshirt sophomore in Kingsland, Georgia, I should say. And then um, they also uh, play this 4-3 uh, with the wheel being Deion Jones, 5'11", 202 pounds, redshirt junior from Belmont, North Carolina. Inside linebacker Keondrick uh, Richardson, 6'2", 14 pound, redshirt junior from Gainesville, Florida. And the Sam is Marcus Albert. Uh, 5'10", 205 pound redshirt senior from College Park, Georgia. So you also have this trend before with uh, Grandma playing this 3-4, but you see a and playing the 4-3. Yep. Mm -hmm. Obviously they're multiple, so they can mix it up mm -hmm. as well. But what do you talk about this offensive line from Grandin going up against this defensive line of North Carolina a and Well, one one of the things that jumps out with, with this North Carolina a uh, and defensive line, they're big and they're deep. You know, they, they go yes. uh, seven, eight uh, across the front. And, and they really get after you. And, uh, you know, you're talking about uh, overall a team with, with 12 first team, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, all MEAC selections. A lot of that, uh, you know, you look at that on the defensive side of the ball. Absolutely. And there's one guy in particular, Jeremy Taylor. Uh, he is a guy who makes tackles all over the field for North Carolina and T's, uh defense. Certainly yeah. great points. And Mike, uh, your thoughts on this uh, defensive yeah. front for yeah. North Carolina a t that terrifies team. Yeah, the, the, the depth is one thing I, I'll, I'll kind of piggy bank on with uh, Charles, but the turnover capability of this defense, um, they have, what, 30, 40 sacks this year? Mm. They have a total of 55 turnovers total, uh, intercepts, and, and a third of those are from off sacks or tackles for losses. So they're a tenacious defense. And you're talking about the FBS team that played this year. They had seven sacks in that game. Yes. <laughs> so Casey, Casey number... Price is getting in here and brings up another point is the if the defensive ends over pursuit is going to be a pretty good day for Kincaid in your point. He certainly is gonna move out of their pocket, yeah. and I'll bring it back to you, Mike. Uh, but it was pointed up yeah. when we asked the defensive guys at the press conference, he said one of the things that they wanted to focus on is to make sure that they funneled him and kept him in the pocket. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting, can they stay disciplined, mm -hmm. as KC Price is bringing up, mm -hmm. and not over-pursue? Because if they do over-pursue, you're certainly right, that you're going to see these guys get out of the pocket. And as we talked about Martez Carter, he has the ability to fan out. Yes. And he's just as dangerous as a receiver, as, as an outlet receiver, yeah. as we've seen over the year, yeah. as making big plays. We've seen that in the State Fair Classic where he took a ball literally 77-plus uh, yards uh, after a little flip uh, as the defensive uh, prayer view for over pursuit. And again, you saw it again in the uh, Bayou Classic yes. where yes. he made – Jaguars uh, are, are having nightmares of what they've seen in terms of their play. So back to you, Mike, in terms of talking a little bit about more about their defense as you were finishing up your analysis there. Yeah, so you, you Jeremy Taylor is one to watch. Yeah. Watch out for. He's the team leader in tackles, and also he has a co-lead in, in believe, it, believe it or not, um, sacks. So, I'm sorry, um, the co-leader in pass defense and breakups. So, that to me says he's a disruptive force on that defense. So he'll be one to watch out for in this game. Uh, the, the other thing is their red zone defense, if 
Grandlin is able to get the ball in the red. The red zone defense for uh, A&T is fairly strong. If you look at the course of 2017, and even coming from 2016, they haven't lost a beat on that red zone defense. Mm -hmm. So, uh, final thing, wanted to go to the backfield, if you would, in terms of the defense by A&T as we yep. kind of start to close up this a little bit. Is the fact that you want to look at the rover here, Jeremy Taylor, five eleven. 190-pound redshirt senior. Make sure you get that out of there. From <laughs> Kingston, North Carolina. Yep. Uh, left cornerback is Mac McCain, 5'11", 174-pound redshirt freshman from Greensboro, North Carolina. Free safety is Jamal Darden, 5'9", 198 senior from Ray Ford, North Carolina. And right cornerback is Demadre Abram, 5'10", 168-pound uh, redshirt junior from Lakeland, Florida. What are your thoughts, Charles, on uh, this young yeah. uh, defensive backfield for North Carolina a Mac McCain, five interceptions on the year. Yep. Uh, he is one pick six away from uh, uh, becoming the 28th player in FCS uh, uh, with uh, two uh, interceptions for TDs in a game. Uh, we're talking about a kid, five interceptions, eight pass breakups this past season. And interesting tidbit, he's the grandson of Franklin McCain, who was one of the Greensboro, Greensboro four. Yes. Uh, yeah, I always like when you tie it in mm -hmm. the history there. Great point there. Uh, Mike, what are your thoughts in terms of this defense backfield? Uh, again, um, I, I have Mac, uh, Mac McCain. Um, I've seen him a play, and if you watch North Carolina, he is, I, I don't want to say he kind of ranks with some of the great cornerbacks, mm -hmm. but if you watch him, he's one guy that you could probably put one-on-one. -on -one with their best receiver, if there mm -hmm. is such. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, will they take that approach? That'll be interesting. So that'll be interesting. He's uh, he's only 5'11", but he plays 6'3", 6'4". Uh, he's, he's so that, that'll be, that to me, that'll be an interesting game within the game. If they mm -hmm. isolate him on one receiver or your best receiver or how they use the, that guy. Sure. So. so let's talk about special teams for both teams. Okay. Uh, we hadn't got it in that, and that's always a different maker in this game. Uh, but you have um, Chris Barton, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, need, has had 92 number of yards. Chris Barton needs to become the all-time leader in punt return yards in NCAA, FCS history. Yep. He is currently second. So he's a big-time player that makes big-time plays. He's been National Special Teams Player of the Year. Honorable mention, uh, yep. five punt returns from 50 yards, one touchdown. Against that Garner Webb that some people talk about. You just talked about Mac. Mac uh, Matt Cain, yep. I want to talk about that. He was also a national freshman player of the yep. year. Mm -hmm. Let you know that, yeah, he's a freshman, very talented. And he's not a freshman anymore. He had two interception returns for touchdowns, three yep. interceptions for 178 year return yards uh, in the victory over Morgan yep. State as they got it. Plays big. Plays, some, plays big. Uh, plays big. Uh, with what goes on there. So that's some big time players, special players that you want to look at. Bramlin has a special team kicker. Yep. Who was a finalist for the Ben Ben Hell Cal Senior HBC yes. Football Award? Yes, indeed. Uh, yes. Talk about Mr. Roscoe. Roscoe. Yeah. Roscoe, as he gets it done, I mean, he's money from forty, and he gets you another play working where you get stuck. You know, you can at least get three points right, exactly. if you can't get in that seven, which I think is quality and why these two teams, in a lot of ways, are here in terms of what they will do all year long. Yeah, I think if there's a, a something that. Uh, tipping point for either team, special teams. Grant was going to have to kick it away yeah. from Chris Garden. Yeah. Uh, he spoke about Marco Roscoe. Uh, he kicked a career, his career long uh, in the SWAC championship against Alcorn, 48-yarder. 48 48 uh, guy who coming into uh, this game, I think he was a 6 of 8 of some sort from 40 and 49 yards. Yeah, I was, uh, I was, I was gonna give, I was gonna round it up to fifty, but no. <laughs> let's, let's, be, let's be accurate. You're right. <laughs> so I think you're accurate. Right. Uh, if if Grandman has to rely on the on the kicking game to win, Mr. Orozco definitely can bring him there. But uh, do you do you kick it to Chris Garden or do you stay away? What <laughs> uh, you, you know what uh, those those type guys you have to uh, keep it away from them. Uh, Deion Sanders. Uh, uh, and yeah. talking about special type players, special kick returners, they just have an ability to see the field different than everybody else. Yeah. So little cracks are, are like big to them. Absolutely. And he's another one that you're going to have to keep it away from. So it'll be a very interesting in terms of uh, special teams what uh, Gramlin tries to do in regards to Chris Garden. So 
I think, you know, it's a little, little game within the game sort of deal yeah. that you really, you know, it's going to be fun keeping an eye out for that today. Uh, do you, uh, uh, one of the questions I had is, do you see a special teams touchdown today? Yeah. If I see a special teams touchdown today, that could be the difference in the ball game. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, I mean these, these teams are, are that closely matched that it would take something like that to, to really tip the balance in one, in one or the other. Way. Absolutely. So, mm -hmm. So, so as we, we close out, before I get your uh, picks on this and everything, we got some uh, special guests in here, mm -hmm. uh, luminaries that are getting it. We got uh, Carlos Brown uh, that had just finished his show, mm -hmm. but we want to get in here and get some analysis from him from a different perspective. Uh, somebody that's uh, looked at Grambling quite a bit in terms of uh, what he's had to do with Southern and watching this analysis. So we want to bring Carlos Brown in here, and then we have Donald Ware that's actually calling the game for North Carolina a &T and does a lot of stuff with Box the Road. So we want to get these people in here and talk a little bit before we close back and bring Mike and Charles back in here uh, with their picks of the game. So I think this gives us a chance to kind of stretch out as we like to partner uh, with the guys to get in here. Come on, Carlos, get in here if you would. Uh, come on and get in here and talk about this matchup. Uh, I know your schedule is busy. As I said, Carlos just came down, had a great show, I'm sure, going inside the numbers. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts about this matchup today. Well, of course, it's two uh, very well-coached teams, disciplined, uh, very explosive, uh, Grambling State University and North Carolina a and uh, I'm going to go a little bit back to the press conference yesterday. Both uh, teams were very confident, those who were represented, and also both coaches. Uh, again, they stressed discipline. They uh, stressed about making big plays. But it's going to come down to Somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. And a and has a lot on the line as well. As Graham, undefeated, they want to be a team that's been, when the record in the history book shows that 2017, they went undefeated. And that's a, a big accomplishment for North Carolina a Certainly. It sounds like you're leaning in the direction, but we're going to hold off before you get there. You know how we do. I've learned like for some of the best. Y'all told me there's a tease in the best. Looks like, sounds like. My good friend here at the he does a great job in terms of what he brings. And as I said, he's calling the game today. So you can tell by people where they can listen to it if they're not watching it live. Yes, or they can watch it on the replay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, uh, on there, you can uh, listen to it there. I like that. Turn turn your TV sound down and turn us up. That'd be, that's cool. yeah, no problem. Yeah. That's what we do here. We try to make sure we get <laughs> love out there. So right. Tell us a little bit about the matchup. You've had a chance to follow this anti Aggie side. Obviously, we're down in the swag land a lot of times, and we kept up with them, watched them when they played on ESPN, the live broadcast, and we follow them. But you got a little inside knowledge. Tell us a little bit about those out there that want to know some things. We went into numbers. What things did you think are going to be the difference in this game? Well, you know, number one, and I had a chance to talk with Carlos about this, Lamar Raynard is absolutely spectacular, the quarterback. He deserves all the accolades that he's getting. Um, and as I was saying to Carlos, the numbers don't even speak to what this young man actually is able to do. The wide receiver core is phenomenal. But watch out for Elijah Bell, the wide receiver for a &T. This kid is all of that. He, by the time he leaves a and he's going to have every a and record. He's going to have a lot of MEAC records. Uh, it's was very hard to, 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 to guard. So he's a big kid, you know, and he runs runs well down the field. So, uh, But, again, I, what concerns me is Devontae Kincaid. Run, quarterbacks that have the ability to run give a and fits. Mm -hmm. I allowed Malcolm Great Bell for three years at North Carolina Central. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, that that is the concern I think that a and should have most is on Kincaid. Certainly. Before I ask you for your score uh, out of this game, tell them again where they can listen to sure. you calling again. Yep, WSJSSports.com. Or you can, if you're, uh, I'm on Facebook as Donald Ware. If you go to my Facebook page, I, we have the link nice. uh, also there. Yep. Nice. And you also do other great work, so tell me about that as well. With Box Row, yeah, you know, it, it, it's 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 been great twelve years now. Uh, as a matter of fact, this weekend we're doing our doing our year in review shows. This is the thirteenth time we've done that. So you know, at the heart of everything is always HBCU sports. I'm a Morgan grad, always going to be HBCU sports. But we've been able to do some other things and talk with some other people. So man, I'm just excited about where we are with Box Row. Certainly, and Carlos, tell them how they can catch up with you. Well, of course, I'm on Facebook. Carlos Brown. Uh, I'm also uh, the Carlos Brown Show has a Facebook page. 
uh, WUBR. You can listen to the show from 10 a.m. to 12 noon Central Standard Time. You can also do that via um, TuneIn app and WUBR. AM 910 has their own app. So 10 a.m. to 12 noon Central Standard Time. And, and what I like over the years doing the show, you get to network with uh, people like yourself, Dr. Cavill, uh, Don Aware, Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. And I, I, I just love that part. Yes, and yes, yes, and yes, you, you never know it all, absolutely. but if you don't know the answer, I know somebody with the relationships I've built that you can go into every part of this country and talk to somebody who can give you the uh, inside perspective. Certainly, with what that, what everybody's waiting for, who do you have for this game? Now, I have a swag hat on. I have a swag hat on. And my heart, I'm a swag guy, a Southern graduate. Sell it. I'm going to pull the ground the state, but my mind tells me that North Carolina a and is going to win. But I have North Carolina a and winning 27 to 21. That's the same score. You got to be consistent that I had on my show. 27 21, certainly. Yeah. Write that down, guys. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, I got oh, it. Yeah. Now that we know yeah. we're getting the check today. So yeah. 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 But you are a professional. Uh, well, so go ahead and put it out there. Yeah, well, no, I, I, I really I really believe it's going to be a close game. It's, it's, you know, I mean, a and defense is just so good, man. I just don't, you know, I, I, I would go 31 to 17. Oh, yeah. So with that, guys, again, just wanted to say thank you for coming in and sharing that Absolutely information not. with you. And whenever we can get uh, – the people that love this, been at it, working on this, I want to make sure I give a platform to do that. So, again, tell them how they can listen to the show today uh, 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 during the game. Sure. Uh, again, WSJSSports.com is how you can listen to the broadcast. Certainly we'll bring Mike and Charles back in here to give their final yeah. picks and updates there. And uh, thank you, gentlemen, for taking that. And we'll sit out there and enjoy the game. You have a great uh, game calling it. Appreciate yeah. I find a way to listen to this. If I can tune in, uh, I've got my little phone and that, so I'll listen to it. give you so, a little love. To it. Sounds good. All right, Doc, appreciate it, man. No problem. Thank, Thank you. you. So, as we uh, change the seats and get Mike back in here, as we start to come to a close, uh, before we get their picks, we're going to talk a little bit about that Elijah Bell player, Casey Price's 2018 Grambling. Uh, I like that prediction in terms of a the score there, so we can get that in there. In terms of that, uh, we have Earl Alexander on here checking us out. Uh, as these guys are seated back in here, uh, let's go with you, Mike. Before we get to our scores, let's go a little bit. We didn't get to talk about Elijah Bell, uh, big playmaker uh, for that side. We went in on Kincaid and Marquez, probably the big two offensive playmakers for Grambling. We talked about Lamar uh, uh, Bernard in terms of the playmaker at the quarterback position uh, for Graham, I mean for North Carolina a and well, you know, while they're solid at the running back position, you do that. The big playmaker, as was alluded to with Donald, was Elijah Bell. Elijah Bell, in 2016, in terms of his career receiving yards, uh, 89 for 1,493. In terms of receiving leaders, single season, to, uh, this season, obviously, 54, 858. Uh, and career touchdowns. Uh, 2016 until now 19. So he's a big time playmaker. What are your thoughts on Elijah Bell, Mike Washington? Uh, I, I think you you said it all. I think um, he is a hidden secret. I think he will bring a lot of focus, but I still kind of go back to Lamar Raynard as well. But I think I think Bell will have a very big game. I think I, I think what was said earlier about him being a big receiver, having big play capability. I think that's going to bring a lot of focus from the Grambling defense, which is a bend but don't, don't break. And they've had their issues with some some receivers in the swag as well. So I think Bell will have a very big game. Sir, and Charles, what are your thoughts on Elijah? Bell? Well, you're talking about a guy, 54 catches coming yeah. into the game, 11 touchdowns. Uh, he's big, 6'2", yeah. two, two, uh, uh, 220, uh, a big receiver. It's going to be a very interesting matchup to see, uh, you know, jump ball situations. Yeah. Uh, to counter that, Kendall Hill for Gremlin, yeah. he's a uh, 6'3 safety. So that's, a, you know, one thing you're, you're going to watch during the course of the game to see who might win a particular jump ball or things of that nature. Yeah. But Elijah Bell, big play receiver. Yeah, leading the MEAC in total offense. Yeah. I mean, you know, 200 – 250 yards a game, yeah, so there's yeah. a lot of offense going through him. Right. So I don't think I don't see anything different with this game. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be how they use him mm -hmm. and how much attention he brings brings to the fray. Yeah, certainly. With that, it's time for us to call in our picks. Uh, for the record, 
Dr. Ville's 2017 HBC Major Division Football Poll Rankings obviously will come out uh, right after this game here as I have North Carolina a t 7 first place, the Aggies 11-0, 8-0, the first place votes. At number two, you have Grandma State with five first place votes, the Tigers 11-1, 7-0 uh, at number two. Uh, but we'll find out today who will be number one with that. I'm going to start at the far end, my <laughs> friend Mike Washington. Who you got in the game? And tell us the score and why. Uh, careful thought, two balanced teams. At the end of the day, I think defense will make uh, – will there will be a one key defensive play, one key uh, uh, special teams. I, it, it, with that, it's being said, Devontae, like, Devontae Kincaid factor considered – I, I have to give the edge to North Carolina a &T. and my score would be 31-24. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a low score in the first quarter, both teams opening up in the second quarter, but I think the discipline of the a &T defense, which will be key, I think they will eventually come to the fray, and I think they'll edge Grambling out 31-24. Uh, mm -hmm. I have Frederick Williams, senior, my barber. I'll be in there this week to get my hair cut. <laughs> uh, in regards to that, I want to make sure I give them a shout out off of I'll meet, I'll meet in Genoa doing great haircut. With that, Charles Bishop, give me uh, your pick for the game, the score, mm -hmm. and why. Well, if you're a Grandma fan, you're going to be excited about this because I picked against Grandma all season. <laughs> and, and they proved me wrong. No! All season. They proved me wrong all season. Uh -huh. So. Uh, today, I'm, you know, I'm a swag guy. I'm going to pick against Gremlin and say <laughs> it's going to be uh, North Carolina a and 20, Gremlin 17. I'm looking for a big play maybe from Chris Gardens uh, somewhere uh, along the way. Uh, but there it is, Gremlin fan. I picked against you all year, but you've beaten me all year. Certainly. Basically, <laughs> basically it's 2-2 two and two with uh, our predictions. So, man, I got it tough to come in here and put all the pressure on me to break this tiebreaker, essentially. Um, with that, I'll hold off and tell you after the game. Oh. No, just, 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 can't do it like that. Uh. Um, in a lot of ways, I just think the Aggie defense is really tough. Uh, they find a good way to get it done. Obviously, we're one and one in this series. A&T went in the first one. Brandon went in last year. And so, I think with Elijah Bell, Lamar Renard, what he's getting done, I think they're going to get it get it done in terms of this matchup. But as they say, not so fast, my friends. Yeah. I'm going to go with Graham Kincaid, okay. the BNL Calvary Senior HBC Football Award winner, Marquez Carter, and uh, just the SWAC. I'm going to stay with it. Uh, I thought a lot about this all week. I was leaning early for the Aggies. Um, while they come in looking for this respect, I think it's certainly going to be big with Grambling is just going to do historic what they always do. They're going to find a way Finally, to win. Yes. Mm -hmm. And before we uh, close out, I think it's perfectly now we get a chance, as you see, uh, the fact that the Groundland State Marching Band is marching in, as you see in the far window there. Who won the, who won the band competition? Certainly. <laughs> Mike, since you brought it up, who do you think is going to win the band competition? Let's start with you. Another big part of uh, HBC football is the band competition. Only because I've seen a lot of chatter and talked to a lot of alumni on the ride over here. Mm -hmm. They feel that they have a point to prove in that category as well. Wow. And so <laughs> you'd be amazed. So I, 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 I'm going to stay out. I'm going to keep with my pattern and stay slightly outside the swag. And I'm going to go with the A&T man. Man, ain't no band in the, in, in the Miyagi fam. So, hey, you got to go for that. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you on that one. I'm sticking with the, the swag bands. I'm going with Grambling, so two to one. Grambling will pull it out. Yep. And we'll give you some updates, and we'll see if we can give you some feed after the game and just do a short analysis mm -hmm. of what came out based on what's going on there. But that will do it for us. I am Dr. Kenyatta Kaville, the sports professor mm -hmm. with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. As we come to close, I hope you uh, enjoy our conversation, especially with our guests in terms of Donald Ware. Uh, and Carlos Brown coming in to give you some quick analysis there. And so we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Ville's Inside HBC Sports Lab radio show with Mike Watson and Charles Bishop. Generally every Tuesday from 545 to 715 right there on KSOH TV 92.9 FM HD2. Uh, the vein where we're pumping your system in the historic KSOH studio in Houston, Texas, which is at www.ksoh-tv.com. Today we're live in Atlanta. Georgia. It's supposed to be hot Atlanta, but it's cold. <laughs> it's going to warm up in here as this action starts to take us to the top of the hour. 
As we're ready for the kickoff, we start to sign off. We're here in the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. And it is our pleasure to bring uh, this analysis to you morning live. And thank you for all the folks that chimed in uh, in terms of this matchup. Continue to check us out. Continue to help us do big and great things. We'll continue to bring you information on HBCU Sports uh, like none other. With that, follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. That's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-J-C-A-V-I-L. Dream big and continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Course, Course lecture dismissed.